it's just been great to kind of walk around and see what's happening here. And um, all kinds of good things are going to happen here over the next few years, I know, for sure. So this, this talk um, is, is very speculative. Uh, I don't like to give talks where I know the answer or I sort of um, have everything figured out, um, as Moya knows. Um, when, she come, when we have conversations, it's always about questions and thinking about things. So this idea of the end of the fair trade consu citizen consumer. So this, this builds on some work that I've done previously around fair trade and sort of trying to follow the market and think about what has meant by uh, the politics around fair trade as it's mainstreamed, as it's been corporatized, and what that means about the relationship between fair trade as a product, consumption, consumer politics, and fair trade movements. And then think about this idea of post-greenwash. This is an idea that it's just literally an idea, thinking about, again, the kind of corporatization of sustainability and what that might mean. And then, and then this idea of resilient capitalism. Well, we need to talk about resilience because it's a buzzword, but it's the idea that capitalism is, is making uh, the world safe for capitalism, okay? And thinking about sort of that. And, and I don't apply these in, uh, explicitly in this talk. They're sort of more in the background, but hopefully you'll see the connections between those few things as I'm going through this. So my speculative talk. So can you guys see that? Yeah, yeah is that all right? Okay. So this question comes from this question of what are the implications for fair trade and ethical and sustainable consumption with the mainstreaming of fair trade markets? And what does this really mean for the kind of figure of the fair trade citizen consumer? And I'm going to talk about what I mean by the citizen consumer and the way that this figure has been developed in, in the literature and popular culture more broadly. And then, and then kind of try and disturb that a little bit more. And that's what I want to do with this work. So the inspiration for this talk is my ongoing interest in thinking about and working to kind of conceptualize ar around this mainstreaming and the kind of so-called success story of fair trade in the UK. It's the largest market in the world. It's over a billion pounds. And that is something to, be, to think about um, uh, very hard in terms of what it's doing, how it's working, and how it's been thought about, and how it's shifted over time. And then my ongoing interest in working through the practices and politics of ethical, alternative, and sustainable <coughs> consumption as a part of two things in particular that I've started to think about. This idea of neoliberal sustainabilities, much broader kind of concept or idea. And underneath it is the idea that consumption and consumer choice is the primary pathway to creating more sustainable societies. So we've, if we only choose differently, we chose organic foods, we chose sustainable products, things would then fall in line and we would become much more sustainable. And thinking about the kind of limit, limits and the, and the benefits to that, that neoliberal sustainability is about the commodification, the marketization of care, responsibility, and solidarity. And thinking about fair trade, it's about the marketization of development. You pay for a fair trade coffee, part of that money goes back to promote development with the poor and marginalized farmers. And the way that neoliberal sustainabilities have distinctly responsibilized consumers as the ones to create and foment change for the care of the self, the planet, and for others. So those are embedded in this idea, this much more broad way of conceptualizing about this um, through this idea of neoliberal sustainabilities. And this, this idea is really illustrated. I've used this quote multiple times because it's so perfect. And it comes from Harriet Lamb, the head of the Fair Trade Foundation. So it's from 2006, but I think it illustrates what I'm talking about. So this is her being quoted talking about fair trade in the newspaper. What works so well is that although we are putting a spotlight on the negative, there is a positive solution to hand which everybody can be part of. You don't have to wait for government to move. You don't even have to wait for companies. Because if you can push them into acting by buying these products, so you've got all of these NGOs, the church groups, and the community-based organizations, but the really fantastic thing about fair trade is that you can then go shopping. It's as simple as that, okay? Illustrating that idea of consumers as the solution and the way they've been responsibilized. And then this idea of post-greenwash. So what I mean by this is the way that corporations... Uh, have, have uh, uh, developed sustainability programs in the way that NGOs, some of which used to be quite radical, have, have, have engaged with and, and, and grown to develop strategies around sustainability with corporations. So we can think about the way that uh, sustainability is now kind of corporate-led and corner, corporate-partnered uh, in terms of sustainability. And I'll give you some examples in a second. 
And the way sustainability has really been turned into a brand, okay? And that sustainable branding is, in my, in my estimation, becoming more important than actually doing the sustainability. So we've moved beyond greenwash into post-greenwash, into a post-greenwash era. I am happy for you to argue with me about that, but I think that's something, or, or one way to think about kind of what's happening at the moment when we think about sustainability and the politics around sustainability. So for some examples of post-greenwash, here's M&S, right? Have you heard about Schwapping? Has everybody heard about Schwapping? Yes, which was actually a very grassroots movement where groups of people would get together and swap clothes. They would take clothes that they didn't like or didn't want anymore and they would change them and swap them with other people. Well, M&S took this idea and said, we're going to develop it as a part of our corporate ethos. So they've come up with, well, and there's Joanna Lumley and some other celebrities. That's my other part of, another part of my work that I'm not going to touch on today, but the role of celebrities is really important in this. But this idea of swapping, M&S has really developed this and brought it on. And in fact, they've started to partner with Oxfam. Okay, there she is again. Change the world, swap. Very simple. We think, that, we think that old clothes shouldn't just be thrown out. They should have a future. So the, um, uh, so the next time you pop into a store to buy something new, drop an old item of clothing, even if it's not from M&S. They will take it and they will uh, deposit it to Oxfam. But at least you think that doesn't mean you should buy clothes from M&S. This is the fact from M&S about swapping. And you can see this down at the bottom. Here's the question. So are you saying that we should buy fewer clothes? Swapping is about challenging and changing the ways that we shop. We're not asking you to stop buying clothes, rather aiming to create a buy one, give one culture, where reusing, recycling, and reselling old clothes becomes the norm. So you can buy new stuff. You can just bring your old stuff in and feel good about it. Another example of this is, I don't know if you've seen this, Unilever has this project, Sunlight. Have you seen this? It's massive. It's all over the place. Okay? The idea is that you do individualized actions. They're really supporting it. They've embedded themselves in thinking about us as parents and the future for children and being sustainable and selling us sustainable products through, and of course, they're all Unilever-related brands. There have now been 133 million acts of individual sunlight. You can go on, you can challenge yourself, you can pledge yourself, right? There's a whole movement around pledging around sustainability and changing your behaviors and actions, right? Again, this corporate-led sustainability. And if you didn't know, Unilever is now partnered with our left-wing newspaper, The Guardian. They have their own area of, it's called the Unilever Partner Zone. And there's, uh, there's now a growing confusion between whether it's about a story about sustainability or choosing products or being more sustainable or a product placement. And you see that over and over and even more now that um, uh, you can see this across uh, news and media that you see product placements that start to appear like news. The Guardian has taken this on full bore and they have their own dedicated web page sponsored by Unilever in their Live Better Challenge section. Okay, So this is idea of this partnership. Uh, this idea of post-greenwash. So there's some examples around that. In essence, this is about the making of sustainable or resilient capitalism. That's where the title comes from. Okay? So I'm, I'm seeing these as wider processes. And, and you'll see in my argument at the end is that fair trade and the co-branding that now goes along with that is, is the, at the forefront of this. So let's talk about the figure of the fair trade citizen consumer. because we, we need to talk about that to think about what I'm going to argue in the, next, in the second half of the talk. This is the figure that has kind of arisen in both academic and popular cultural accounts. You can see that again in Harriet Lamb's quote about what consumers can do. It's about going shopping. This is the figure who uses ethical consumption to enlist themselves and their ordinary actions into broader projects of social change. There are in the literature both celebratory but also critical takes on this, so I don't want you to think that people haven't looked at this critically. Many people have. But there is still this figure that is there and has been built up and is one that we think about and engage with when we think about sustainability and sustainable consumption. So my focus here is to destabilize and disturb this figure a bit further. So let's think about it. What is the citizen consumer? How have they been constructed? This is a person who actively chooses specific goods to enact their politics. These are about conscious decisions. It is about choice, which I'll get to in a second. It is about a kind of conscious ethics and morality that goes along with that, that's embedded in this figure. And they also vote with their wallet. I'm sure you've heard this term over and over again. Vote with your wallet. Choose particular products. And that means that people, these citizen consumers, often pay more for ethical goods. 
Okay, another line of thinking. I've embedded some, some, some criticism into this already. This is a kind of economic ration form of citizenship that's very problematic. Okay? When we think about this, I'm not going to go into it a bit more. I've got, I've got some other thoughts about that, but I'm, I'm going to continue on with the talk. So, this idea that this is an economic ration form of citizenship. You have the money, you can buy fair trade organic coffee, you can buy organic products. Those who can, can afford or have the cultural capital to buy fair trade, for example, are those who can get to partake as citizens. That's a problem. But that's also embedded in this idea of the citizen consumer. Second, individual choice. This kind of pre-consumption decision making is politicized and is political. As active choice is embedded with political meanings and real effects. An idea of ethical development. Again, we think about fair trade. You make that conscious decision to make an, a choice for that product. That choice is then embedded with politics and also real effects. That money then goes back to the farmers. It is an uh, individual choice is an enactment of these politics through a kind of moralized act of local and global connection through this choice. So it's not just about being a citizen consumer. It's also about more about global citizenship. This idea that you're connecting to other places, other environments, other parts of the world, other people. And there's that. It is individual choice is an act of care and responsibility for others and other ecologies. So care and responsibility tends to be narrated on the label and the marketing. If you know some of my other work, I focused on this. So you get to see where that money is going. And it's put in a language that makes those connections specifically and tries to develop that idea of the citizen consumer and global citizens. This is from Fair Trade. This is some of their online campaigns where you can meet the producers. And then this statement over here, a nice fair trade cuppa for you, stable fair trade income for tea pluckers. Okay? So that's also embedded in this idea of individual choice, and it has to be narrated through these images, which it is, and, and they're very powerful. Moving on to this idea of consumption. Consumption then is thought about as an isolated moral act of local global connection. It is an act of care or responsibility for others and ecologies, much like individual choice. But because care and responsibility are attached to a commodity and consumption, they are effectively given a price and thus commoditized or commodified. Again, going back to that idea of neoliberal sustainability. Other work has focused, Clive Barnett's work, uh, and they've written a book called Globalizing Responsibility. What they say is that these individualized consumption acts can then be collective or collectivized or aggregated uh, for political outcomes. Again, the idea is that Fair trade, you make a fair trade purchase, fair trade coffee. Some of that money goes back to the Fair Trade Foundation. The Fair Trade Foundation takes that money and uses it to lobby the UK government to change trade rules. This is the idea of cha a chain of kind of consumption effects. That means that these individualized actions can be aggregated and then put forward for political outcomes. All right, so now I've set the scene. This is the idea, the kind of figure, the essentialized figure of the citizen consumer. I need to let you know that the UK fair trade market is mainstreamed. That is important. I'm going to give you some data. Of the global market for fair trade goods, which is 5 billion euros, over 1.78 billion pounds is in the UK. Sainsbury's is the world's largest seller of fair trade products uh, at 276 million pounds in 2010. And they expect their sales to rise to 500 million in 2015. One in three bananas sold in the UK is now fair trade. 44% of bagged sugar sold in the UK is fair trade certified. 25% of all roast and ground retail coffee in the UK is fair trade certified. A lot of that sold through Cafe Direct, who is one of the kind of poster, poster companies for successful fair trade businesses. Chiquita, Starbucks, Tate and Lyle, Nestle, Cadbury's all have fair trade lines of goods. Mainstreaming has been pursued through a series of movements and processes. It's been pursued through getting fair trade goods into supermarkets to expand sales. Supermarkets have devised their own label brands of fair trade uh, products, which has actually been incredibly fundamental in shifting um, some of the ways that it gets to us. I'll show you a map of that in a second. There's been a, a rise of exclusive supplies in supermarkets, so Sainsbury's only sells fair trade bananas. There's the rise of the kind of fair trade only universities and caterers. And then co-branding is the new move, right? So co-branding with multinationals. We get co-branding of fair trade with Nestle. 
Mars, and Cadbury. And that's what I'm going to talk about in the second half of this talk. What co-branding means, what it means for the idea of the fair trade consumer, and uh, the fair trade citizen consumer, and what we might think of as the rise of the fair trade corporate citizen. So we've seen over time the kind of conventionalization, the ordinaryization, the normalization as everyday choice through expanded availability, cheaper prices, and co-branding of fair trade goods in the UK. Why? I'll give you some more reasons. There's been a push. NGOs and the Fair Trade Foundation in particular have been very good at pushing and lobbying supermarkets, government as well as corporations, uh, to, uh, a, a, and pushing fair trade as, as products of quality. Okay? So quality has increased, therefore more people want to sell it, it tastes better. And there's gen been a kind of generalized, I think, very massively successful marketing campaign around fair trade Fortnite. I was putting this talk together a couple days ago. In the morning, my son, six-year-old son, came in, and this image was on the screen, and he said, hey, that's Foncho, right? Anybody who has kids this year will know that this was the campaign for fair trade Fortnite this year. Stick with Foncho, make fair trade bananas fair. Incredibly, they took the, the kind of you know, the image of the fist, they've got the fist and the banana. These people know what they're doing. They know how to market. They are incredibly good at it. And they know what to do. And it's been very successful. So there it is. There's Foncho. Uh, farmers have also pushed uh, fair trade into the market, of course, because it provides more money, more stable source of income. And then citizen consumers themselves have done things like started guerrilla campaigns to go into supermarkets and ask for supplies of fair trade, written letters to companies like Starbucks to say supply fair trade coffee for us. And then fair trade companies as well have also been quite successful in getting it into the market. There's been a pull as well. Supermarkets certainly want the halo effect of fair trade and what it brings to them in terms of competition, right? 75% of uh, uh, food sold in, in this country is, is through four, uh, four companies. This, in effect, tries to diffuse that, those sorts of critical questions about control of the food supply. Conventional food corporations have been incredibly interested in uh, pulling in supplies of fair trade goods, again, also because of the halo effect. But for cocoa, there's been some, some indications that these decisions to, to uh, source fair trade cocoa were much about establishing long-term sources of quality from places like the Ivory Coast and Ghana, as much as the kind of guerrilla citizen consumers or the desire, desire for the halo effect. That's, that's, um, that's sort of un... I haven't had anybody sort of um, say that to me directly on the record. Those have been indicated to me off the record when I've done interviews with people. And then, of course, fair trade companies also want to grow the market, Cafe Direct uh, as well, and again, how successful they've been. So the rise of this mainstreaming has done one thing that I think is really interesting and that I want to bring up today. They've, they've, they've developed a series of new and different industrial fair trade supply chains. The old market used to be you would have the farmers and the cooperatives. You might, in, say, somewhere in Africa or in South America, you might have an importer in the United States or in the UK, and that importer would sell it either to a company or would take it as an importer, say, Cafe Direct, and put it on the shelves of a retailer. This is no longer the case. This no longer this, this sort of uh, direct connection between the producers and the importers and the companies no longer it, it exists for some companies, but on the majority of the market as it's grown, it no longer exists. So you get supply chains that look like this. Okay? So here we might see the, uh, this, this number one might be the, um, the, the original producers export themselves into the shipping company to the importer, to the brander, the manufacturer, to the retailer, to the consumer. Now we get the rise of things like a, just a broad fair trade market. So producers sell it onto the open market. Those fair trade supplies, they have no idea where they come from, then move to the shipping company, to the importer, another licensor or a brander, or in fact something like a, a, a supermarket own brand label company, uh, own, own brand label product will be developed, moves to the retailer and to the consumer. So you, you see the sort of the, the, the loss of that transparency and the loss of those direct, direct connections over time. But you also see the rise of the market and the market grow. And this is what, I, what I've called the kind of the fair trade's Faustian bargain. So to expand the market and grow supplies and thus provide more development, right? Larger markets, more sales means more development goes back 
to the smaller farmers, to marginalized producers. The premium for fair trade across the market in the UK uh, was 23 million in 2013. So that has, has moved up exponentially as the market has expanded. That's the amount of money that has gone back as the premium for development. So we get, quote, more development. This has brought in some of the most problematic and I would argue most powerful players to fair trade networks. Supermarkets and global multinationals that I think fair trade was set up to subvert and be resistant to from the beginning. The idea of the Faustian bargain. Moving away from these kind of direct trade relations of solidarity that define the movement and the market as I just showed you so on that map and those supply chains. And the focus has shifted onto increasing sales by any means necessary. It's turned into a product and a brand. And so you see the rise of this kind of consequentialist ethics that the ends justify the means. And we've moved away from the kind of political economy and structural inequalities as part of the pedagogical story that fair trade has told and that demands change around. It's about growing the market rather than shifting trade relationships, I would argue, at the moment. And more recent developments, I think, highlight this even more. Have you heard, has anybody heard about the Fair Trade Sourcing Program? No? Yeah? Some of you? Okay, this is the idea that when you used to have to sell Fair Trade products, the majority of the products in, say, a chocolate bar, like the uh, sugar and the cocoa, had to be Fair Trade. Now, they've changed that. So that means that you can call a Fair Trade chocolate bar, Fair Trade chocolate bar, only having fair trade cocoa. So it only has to be one product in the, uh, in the one uh, ingredient in the product that you're selling. So this is, you, you see the rise, this is called the fair trade sourcing program, whereby companies only need to use one fair trade product and they can have the fair trade logo, although that's now shifted to a different color. It doesn't have the color, it's white. Again, part of the Faustian bargain. Flow reports, the Fair Trade Leveling Organization reports a 14% rise in sales of fair trade cocoa, and they put it down to this program. Again, this Faustian bargain. What do we mean by fair trade? And that's really shifted, I think, over time as the market has expanded. All right, so I want to move on to what I call this kind of deepening of the, bar the bargain, this idea of co-branding of fair trade and multinational brands, and here they are. These are some of the most popular lines, as those of you who buy chocolate know, in these companies' uh, series of lines of products that they sell. Kit Kat is now, you can only buy this, uh, this bar of Kit Kat with fair trade. That line, of, that line of product within Nestle, the Kit Kat line, is only fair trade, uh, the only a fair trade Kit Kat. Dairy milk at this size is only fair trade. Maltesers, and there's the, new, there's the new label, the white one, so it's the Fair Trade um, Sourcing Program. These Maltesers of that size in this line are only Fair Trade. Is that clear? So these lines can only be purchased as Fair Trade products. You can no longer make a choice, okay, in here, and that's going to be my kind of big point. And the idea that you can't make a choice brings up some kind of interesting conceptual things around this idea of the citizen consumer. So the implications of fair trade's co-branding. So this, in effect, is what I'm calling this kind of this idea of the end or the death of the citizen consumer. Could be good, could be bad. We can argue about that. But I think conceptually, it's interesting. So the pathway to the citizen consumer is gone. Active choice with these products in these lines for fair trade in these widely popular lines is gone. There is no choice for fair trade good in these lines of goods. Again, part of the Faustian bargain. It opens up, and a question. Does it open up because these are cheaper priced? Because they're in existing brands? Does it open up a pathway to, to more normal citizens? Those people who used to buy Kit Kats or dairy milk at that size or Maltesers before now can only buy fair trade goods. Is this a kind of democratization of choice? It's a question. Choice has been, to me, thinking more critically about it, choice has been depoliticized, demoralized, and deconnected with these products. Ethical consumption as a kind of a function of these lines is normalized and is every day now more than ever. The ethics of the ethical consumption have disappeared and no longer exist. 
Instead, they are replaced with the ethics of brand consumption. Continuing on, other implications. Fair trade itself gets another quality bump. It was always about increasing the quality of the products. It now is associated with already considered high quality products. The fair trade logo, this is important, takes on new and broadened meetings. Consumption's kind of moral connections to fair trade farmers is minimized and refracted through the logo. The logo takes on particular and important new sets of meanings because we don't have those kinds of images and those connections. Commodification of fair trade farmers and livelihoods is shifted onto the logo and it shifts onto a more kind of behind the scenes or layered sense of commodification. Care and responsibility are also shifted on, on the logo. This idea of other focused solidarity is fully branded. That pedagogical transparency of fair trade has moved into dedicated marketing campaigns like Foncho and onto the web where you can get much more sense of where your products come from. How am I doing for time? Um, ten, Great, that's perfect, excellent. The logo becomes a kind of co-brand in and of its own right. Okay, the logo, that fair trade logo, which for some in the movement was, was, was where they wanted to be. So rising from the ashes of this fair trade consumer citizen, we get the fair trade corporate citizen, right? That's the next step. Active politicized or political choice once the purview of the citizen consumer. Let me take you through this. To, on, to only source and supply fair trade goods shifts on to the corporation. Fair trade is even now a more kind of business decision based on profit loss, reputational capital, and not consumer choice. There's a shift in this kind of location of the decisional power about the choice for fair trade. Is that making sense? So I think there's implications about that. Through the figure that now makes this active choice, that of the fair trade corporate citizen, care and responsibility is firmly lodged into the hands of the corporation and embedded in these brands and not existing in the fair trade narratives anymore. So we see building off of um, Lukakis's work, which is excellent around fair trade and its mainstreaming. She talks about the idea of the brandification of care which I think is a step beyond the commodification of care, if that makes any sense. That's the way I think about it anyway. They're related, but we've now moved into the brandification of care. Global and moral connections in fair trade in particular. Global and moral connections to others are also firmly lodged within these corporations, one of which is one of the most boycotted company on the planet, Nestle. Okay, I'm going to skip over that. So some parting shots for you. Actually, I won't. I'll go back to that. Because I've still got more time. Okay. So what I wanted to do in thinking about this and what's happened and the implications it has for the brand, the choice, and the type of good, vis-a-vis -vis other kind of conventional goods related to these things. So we think about the early and the niche fair trade goods, right? So, so put your mind back to the good old days of Cafe Direct and a few kind of fair trade chocolate companies that were separate, that weren't related to corporations. So we think about the early and niche fair trade goods. What we have here is a different brand or corporation, so Cafe Direct. We also have a different signifier, the fair trade logo. Is everybody familiar with Brand Aid or Product Red? Has anybody read the Brand Aid book? Stefano Ponte and Lisa Ann Ritchie. So brand aid is an idea that they've come up with come based off of product red. Is anybody familiar with product red? Okay, well, I'll, I'll give you a, a snippet. So product red is where a major corporation, Armani, Boss, Bugaboo, Prams, for those of you who have kids, Apple and the iPod, they would take one product in their line of products and make it a red product. That means, so for example, I have a red iPod. That means when you go to purchase that product, it's labeled and branded as a red branded product. Okay, so red, those red branded products, when you buy them, the company, so Apple will take a slice off of the top of their profits and take that money 
that would then go to the Global Fund for AIDS. Okay? So it doesn't cost any more. You're associating it with a top quality brand. Um, and you're taking some of that money as a corporate, it's a corporate, basically a corporate donation to the Global Fund for AIDS to help promote the um, uh, less spread of AIDS in, in, in uh, um, HIV in, uh, in, in Africa in particular. So this is connected to Bono, Jeffrey Sachs, a bunch of other celebrities as well. So compare that to, right, so we've got the early and niche fair trade goods, thinking of Cafe Direct, it's a different brand or corporation. It's a different signifier. With Brand Aid, you've got the same brand and corporation, and you've got a different signifier. It's labeled as red. Now, let's go to co-branded fair trade products. You've got the same brand or corporation, Nestle Cadbury's. You've got a different, but you've got a now a much fam more familiar signifier, the fair trade logo that has been completely conventionalized. Okay? So that was just a way for me to think about the relationships between choice and brand and the type of good and how this has shifted across these different products and ways of branding or, uh, sustainable consumption and sustainable consumption products versus other types of products. Is that making sense? Okay. So some parting shots, getting towards the end. So the implication of what is essentially an expansion of power in fair trade networks to corporations to actively choose and become and maintain corporate citizenship versus. So that's, that's what I'm talking about. This is what essentially has happened. You see the expansion of power in fair trade networks to corporations versus, again, this deepening of the Faustian, bar Faustian bargain, versus lowered cost and indeed no choice, again, which was the ultimate kind of goal of the movement for mainstreaming. You make every, line of, every product line fair trade, then people don't have to think about it. It increases in market share and thus more development and co-branding with powerful and problematic multinationals. So on the one hand, we have the expansion of power in fair trade networks to corporations. On the other hand, we have lower cost, no choice in the sense that it's been completely mainstreamed into a series of different product lines. So you theoretically increase the market share and thus promote more development. We see the further bifurcation of fair trade markets and movements. So the bifurcation in the sense that there's the corporate fair trade versus the 100% companies like Cafe Direct. And now a third way, which is the fair trade sourcing program and the relationship to corporations around that. So you see the rise in this kind of, and even more embedding conflict over the ideology of how to make and change or support farmers and smaller farmers. And to me, this was a fundamentally a choice by the Fair Trade Foundation. They went this route, they went the corporate route, on purpose and they could have pushed the 100% companies and they didn't. Maybe they think it's not a choice but I don't know we have to ask that question about uh, the choice of how the movement was supported over time. My biggest point, corporate fair trade is beginning to define a kind of new post greenwash era and you see the kind of co-branding of fair trade as the vanguard of that era. With fair trade, it's not been a case of co-option by corporations, but invitations by NGOs. Corporations are fundamentally, practically, and materially leading the way on sustainability and are pursued by NGOs. Corporate citizens, front and center, who are pursued and engaged, and so this is, again, this is not about, uh, this is not about co-option. It's not about corporations taking on and building on it. They've been asked to be embedded in fair trade in particular. For those who pursue this sort of movement, it is about the, the, the way that many of these corporate players are too big to ignore with respect to sustainability. Thus, any change, the fact that Nestle or Cadbury's does decide to sell a fair trade product, increases the market massively, therefore more development. So any changes with the corporations is a big change. And this fundamentally, I think, maintains corporate power and indeed embeds it further in the system like fair trade and does not at all challenge the more radical and transformative ways that perhaps a lot of us would like. And I just want to en uh, end on this point, which uh, I don't want to be nihil nihilistic. I want us to think more about what are the alternatives and how can we think about shifting fair trade or supporting different aspects of it. Because I think until fair trade kind of uncouples market growth or at least that aspect of the fair trade market of sales from development, I think little will change, okay?
That's it.